material to cover here. And I kind of did a little bait and switch because <laughs> um, I, I, I think what ended up happening in this, I was originally going to do kind of an overview of uh, species decline, which, uh, which is really something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but I want to focus, I want to really narrow that focus back on the poaching, which is uh, something that I did last year for the MBTI was uh, talk about global poaching issues. And, um, and there's a reason for, for me coming back to it. And for those of you that were uh, a part of my presentation last year, you realize that I did the MBTI last year, just a couple of days before I headed to uh, East Africa. And, um, and I've done a lot of traveling since then as a research for, uh, for my next book. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So let's talk about the title real quick. It's a global affluence issue. Um, that's kind of a big thing and we'll talk much more about that later. My background is uh, as a journalist, I was a newspaper journalist for seven and a half years. My last two years were with the Tacoma News Tribune here in Washington State. Uh, I covered the uh, military beat uh, combat units and, uh, and I was actually very lucky to uh, go on MBIT assignments and uh, spend time with the troops uh, in a wartime situation. And through reporting, I developed a, uh, a good sense of the fact that there's always a deeper story beneath the stories that you hear about on the news. There's so many different perspectives and there's so much involved in the things that you hear. So diving deeper into a story is what drives me. And um, it's what drove me into filmmaking. I started uh, doing documentary films in 2011 uh, with a sea turtle documentary called Journey Home. And, um, and there's so many organizations out there right now that are actually working to help, and help save endangered species that uh, narrowing my focus was difficult. And uh, I chose Loggerhead Marine Life Center in, in uh, Juneau, Florida. And uh, actually I got to, to have free access to everything they did. As you can see, I'm in there with my camera as they're doing uh, prep for surgery on a sea turtle patient. And, um, and they do a lot of rehabilitation work here, which is taking in injured and ill sea turtles and eventually getting them back into the wild. These things culminate in films. These are my two latest projects. Well, films and books, actually. Um, Deconstructing Eden came out last year, the end of the year, and, uh, and is still doing the film festival circuit, but it's winning quite a few awards out there, uh, film of the year, and uh, it's made semi-finalists for two film posts now for uh, film of the year and documentary category. And that's important to me because that means that the word's getting out, the message of the film is getting out. And then secondly, um, I, I, I write, and that's the core of what I do, having been a journalist. And uh, Rough Cut, my book, uh, just came out last year as well. And, uh, and that really talks about all the animals and all the issues that I've covered in the past six years. So that's a brief who I am. But, uh, whoops, there we go. But I want to dive right into this. So the impetus last year for me to travel to Africa, specifically to Tanzania, hi Kelly, is um, it's it's a crisis situation, and we're looking at a very very sharp decline in uh, African elephant populations, and and this was startling because up until about 2013, we actually didn't have an idea of how drastic this decline was. And, uh, and how precipitous it is towards losing the species entirely. So what, what the, the concern is, is that we're watching an extinction happening. And the underlying cause for this drive towards extinction is poaching. Kind of the epicenter of this issue is Tanzania. And that's because they have a very large population, a lot of national parks. And they're also in a confluence zone, even though they're a very stable country. They're not a war-torn country. Um, they're in a confluence zone, being in the Rift Valley and, uh, and being hemmed in between countries that are not as stable of, uh, of different things that lend itself to supporting poaching, like the, uh, the arms trade, selling illegal arms, uh, the drug trade, that sort of thing. And, um, and as you can see, this decline is so rapid 
that uh, that if it doesn't stop very soon, we're we're not going to have enough genetic diversity left in the uh, in the African elephant population to continue it. So that's a concern. So what's happening on the ground? And uh, trying to advance a slide here, and I'll just do this up here. There we go. So. When I got to Tanzania, one of my main missions was to go out and actually see elephants in the wild. And I went to uh, three different national parks of theirs where elephants are, are endemic in that area. And uh, this was Tarangiri, which is one of my favorite MPs, uh, national parks out there. And the reason for this is it, Tarangiri is uh, it's the main home for elephants. Uh, in Tanzania, and you can go there in a single day and see 60 to 100 uh, wild elephants doing their thing, and and so that's that's what I was doing. And the thing about it was, you know, you, you get a strong sense when you're around the African elephants in the wild of the 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 family bonds, um, their social bonds, um, the peaceful nature in general. Of the African elephants, and it's tragic because people focus in on this, their tusk, ivory. So ivory, as a component, as as a as an animal part, is worth more actually per pound than platinum or gold. And so poaching ivory is a lucrative business, but it's not lucrative for the people that actually do the poaching. I'm going to talk about that in a second because I had the chance to meet with a few poachers. The problem is, is that they're after the tusk. So they're after the biggest, longest tusk out there. And uh, this mama and baby, that, that baby that you see in the picture is actually probably just a few days old, maybe a week. And, um, and the female that's with it is not that old. You can tell because she doesn't really have long tusk in. Um, and that's because you don't see that as frequently anymore. They're called tuskers. When their tusks are really, really, really huge, uh, and 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 you know, pretty much curve all the way out in front of them and down towards the ground, uh, that's becoming very rare, and you don't see it as much because those are the the main targets of elephant poaching. And of course, that's because they can get more uh, money from those larger tusks. Elephants need tusks. <laughs> and and this is a good example of, of of what they do with their tusk out in the wild. Um, these trees are huge and old, and that entire damage, what looks like damage, that wearing of the trunk there, that is entirely from from elephants, and a lot of it recent because you can tell because there's a moisture to the eye. Uh, elephants typically can live up until, well, in the wild, they're known to live to up until about 80 years. And um, and we don't actually have a, a real end cap for how long they live because studying elephants can be uh, can be a little bit difficult and it's just something that's been recently implemented as far as tracking uh, individuals. And uh, But they live a long time and their gestation, that is to say their pregnancies, are much longer than, than let's say, a human pregnancy. So for for a reproductive female, uh, she can go from, from about 18, 19 years old until, let's say, she's in her 40s or 50s, um, having, at best, the opportunity to have one baby every two to three years. And, uh, and it doesn't ever work out like that. But it, takes them, uh, it actually takes them almost two years to gestate, to, to give birth to an elephant. And it... It helps that they live longer, but they're being killed on a rate that's so frequent. Even during this talk, while I'm sitting here talking to you, um, there will be more than four elephants killed in Tanzania alone. So, I mean, their numbers drop very quickly. And their benefit of having those tusks and being out there in the wild is, is more than just helping elephants. Uh, this is the savanna, and elephants are needed to maintain the health of the savanna, and if, if you don't lose or if you don't keep up the health of the ecosystem, um, that is the African savanna, you lose more than elephants. Um, there's massive migrations that take place through Tanzania, through Kenya, and um, and these great migrations would be strongly adversely affected 
FDI. Elephants are no, were no longer part of the equation because they helped provide help to small plants and um, and to larger trees out there. You know, it looked like they were damaging that tree in the other picture, but the reality is they need to do that <laughs> um, because there's there's kind of a renewal process as they wear down a, a tree as it as it is toppled. Um, it makes room for things to grow, and the nutrients supplied by the by the tree that starts rotting feeds not only the the, the shrubbery but it, it feeds insects and other and becomes a home for other animals. So it's incredibly important. This is a poacher, and I had a, a long conversation with him, and I, he's not an elephant poacher. Actually, you'll see around his neck he's got a a really big look in a slingshot his main source of uh of income was to uh go around rice paddies outside of uh, mashi tanzania and poach birds uh wild birds out there and the reason that this was really lucrative for him was that the farmers helped pay him in food and uh and then he would also have the availability to uh sell bush meat that is to say the the meat harvested from what he killed and he was a pretty pretty nice guy to talk to um didn't see a problem with what he was doing and ironically he actually uh he had an issue with killing elephants uh african elephants are endangered and uh and asian elephants are critically endangered and we'll talk about asian elephants in a minute um african elephants their decline was so fast and uh, and so sharp that uh, that some people estimate that their wild populations may be gone within 30 years. So one thing about talking to a poacher is is changing the mindset because I went into this project uh, as I started a year and a half ago with the idea that poaching was poverty driven. That is to say that because people are so poor, they'll do anything to survive. I found out that's not exactly the case. Um, so this poacher did clue me in on one other thing, that um, on occasion he took monkeys. And for him, monkeys were worth more alive than they were dead. And that's because um, monkeys are traded in an international trade of primates that, uh, that tops more than $6 billion a year just in selling primates illegally. Uh, captured in uh, in Africa, South America, and and Asia, and uh, to become house pets in there. And the problem is with uh, with taking in uh, a monkey as a house pet. I'm I'm looking at the actual statistic right now. Is you're looking at uh, when a monkey becomes a pet. Uh, on average, they don't live more than two years as a pet, and that's because they're not designed to be house pets. And even your tiniest monkey, like a squirrel monkey or a little lemur, um, is like a two-year-old that will never get potty trained and, uh, and will be hyper-destructive as it gets older uh, for the rest of its life. So they're not really a good pet option. They were never supposed to be pets. And, of course, I don't believe in captivity in general. And, uh, and, and then what's sad is when you look at these these poverty-stricken countries in Tanzania, Uganda, Malawi, these countries have starvation cycles. And you would think that monkeys would be worth more as food, but they're not poaching them for food. They're poaching them to sell to a foreign tourist. So not everyone is uh, in, in Tanzania, not every person that lives there is a... Uh, candidate for for becoming a potential poacher and i say that because people like to think of of uh, i love this and i hate it but i love it <laughs> uh people talk about africa people said oh you went to africa and the truth is i went to tanzania which is in africa it's a country in africa so every one of these countries is very different their cultures are very different and tanzania benefits from having a very unique tribal connection in their in their culture that is a cattle based society 
that does not hunt. They have never, in thousands of years, this tribe has never hunted. They've always been a uh, herding uh, society, a cattle society, and they're called Maasai. And the Maasai people are the only people that are allowed now to live in the national parks. In this village, um, I'm pointing to the screen, <laughs> um, there's a set of huts that you see on the on the right-hand side of the picture. And uh, and that's a Maasai village in Nagorogoro uh, Crater, which is one of the most protected national parks. And the reason for this is they, they are natural anti-poaching people. They will defend wild animals from poachers because they don't hunt wild animals. It's against their culture to do that. And I learned a lot from them. So I spent a couple of days with this tribe. And uh, and the Maasai people are, are a little bit different than, let's say, the Chaga tribe, which is another tribe in, in Tanzania, because they were traditionally nomadic and are now having to settle down and build villages. And that's driven by a lot of things. Um, the, the primary driver of that right now is actually uh, there's, I don't know, within the past 20 years, such a, a difficult change in the climate and urbanization that they're driven into into living in one place. To answer Donna's question uh, of how many types of elephants there are um, in Africa alone, there's at least four that I can think of. And in Asia, there's three that I can think of. And um, I would say worldwide, there's at least 10 different kinds of elephants. Um, you have pygmy elephants, you have forest elephants, you have the savanna elephants. In, uh, in China, and we'll talk about China in a minute. In China, they have their own elephants. They have a, an Asian elephant. Uh, yes, I have met tons of <laughs> real elephants. Uh, I got charged by a bull elephant in Tanzania while on safari, um, which is not something you want to fool with. They're, they're really big and strong. Um, but mostly what I saw were families. And they were grazing and sticking together. And the babies are, are, for lack of a better term, they're just mama's children. You know, they stick around the legs of the mama and they they hang out. Um, it's a different experience to be around them in the wild. And let's say, in, at, if you go to the zoo and you see them just standing there, uh, an active elephant doing what it what it does in the wild, with just traveling and staying with its family. And moving from a water hole to an eating area, defending its young, is a very dynamic social creature. So the Maasai taught me a few different things. One of the things that they, that they imparted to me, one of the things that they wanted to make sure that I learned while I was there, was that they were not going to give up their culture, which is important in protecting animals in Africa. Because as far as um, tribes that have a culture based on not hunting wild animals, you really want to see them stay in the national parks. It's become a political issue within East Africa of the Maasai um, having a place to call their own because they weren't endemic. That is to say they weren't indigenous to, uh, to like Tanzania. They came to Tanzania from outside the country. And, um, but thousands of years ago, it's being argued that they don't have a claim to what they consider to be their traditional areas of living. So as they're moved and they're pushed out of national parks, uh, it takes out a line of defense switching. So the poaching question leads you into China because here's the thing. Um, up until recently, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, these have all been countries, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, these have all been epicenter countries for uh, the, the receiving of illegal ivory. And uh, so these tusks that were taken from elephants are shipped away from Africa and they're flown into Asia. And up until very recently, they were, um, they were created into artworks. They were sold in stores. And that's where they actually become worth a lot of money. So the average poacher, just to back up a second, the average poacher that uh, kills an elephant per tusk, they're lucky if they get $10 from a tusk. The tusk itself, once it's sold from Africa to Asia, sells for at least $5,000 a tusk. 
so the poachers are not making making money. Um, they're barely subsisting on that, and and that's one of the reasons it's actually pretty easy uh, to start working with them to to kind of lower the number of people that are attracted to poaching. The laws are very strict now, and in Tanzania, you can be shot for poaching elephants, and uh, so poachers die every year in battles with park rangers, and uh, and so. That's one part of the equation. The other part of it, though, is where it ends up. And so for many years, we're talking about China. And the slide that you see is, is me talking about shrinking habitats for pandas. And it's, it's a weird connection because uh, pandas, these guys, are actually still endangered in a technical sense, but they were just recently taken off of the endangered species list because their numbers have barely peaked over 3,000 again. The problem is that uh, they're not recovering fast enough for that to be sustainable. So they may end up back on the endangered species list downside. So I decided that one of the things that I wanted to do was to go back and take a step back, I should say, and look at the um, look at where poaching materials ended up. So all the stuff that's on Tanzania, the poachers that I met, what's the next step in the chain? So going to China, of course, was serious research, as you can see here. Um, actually, it was, but I, I was lucky to spend a few days doing a little sightseeing. China is a beautiful country, uh, amazing people, great culture, lots of history. And, um, and I wanted to know why ivory was still a thing in China. Now, it should be noted that uh, as of the end of the year last year, China put a ban on the production of, uh, of creating artwork out of ivory to be sold on the foreign market. And, um, and they've also put a ban in place that went in, uh, into uh, action this year, the beginning of the year, for... Um, no longer getting uh, domestic ivory. So it's important to, to note they're taking steps. And then Hong Kong uh, just announced a couple of days ago they're following suit. By 2021, Hong Kong will do the exact same thing. They will no longer allow ivory to be transported in, and they will no longer process ivory for sale. This is an ivory carver outside of Beijing. Um, one of the last, and uh, one of the last legal carvers. Now, that's not to say that illegal carving and illegal sales will not still happen. It probably will. China has 1.3 billion people, and uh, like B with a billion there, you know? And um, there's a lot of conduits to get stuff illegally in and out of that big of a country. And uh, so this particular carver is not one that I spoke to, but... A gentleman that was on a on a break was sitting outside later on of this uh, this factory here, and I got a chance to talk to him, and and he said he's already started a transition of learning to cut jade, which is another great industry in China, is to create carvings and artistry out of jade, and for him he's 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 okay making the transition because it means he still has a job, um, but the problem is. He has a mindset, and a lot of the carvers probably believe the same thing, that uh, ivory is a more important, uh, more precious thing to carve. It's like people that carve gold or they carve uh, platinum, and, um, and jade is not as precious to them that way. So when you go into a, an ivory market, and this one should be, fully transitioned, like half of the store was actually jade and uh, half of it was ivory products. Um, they were already implementing these uh, checks and balances on, on selling ivory materials and it's very expensive. So there was a chess piece that was about uh, two inches tall that I was looking at to see what the cost would be and they didn't actually have price tags on them. And, and so I had to ask her to take it out of the case. And I'm looking at this chess piece that was carved maybe a week before I'd come that uh, was $500 for the carved chess piece. 
you know, if you can think about that in terms of buying an entire chessboard, you're talking thousands of dollars. It's a huge commodity. And uh, when I say commodity, I'm talking about something that that has an artificial worth to it, and uh, and which is what all animal commodities are. It's an artificial worth. We deem them to be worth money because many different reasons. Scarcity is one of them. And um, and the problem that continues with this is even though China and Hong Kong are dropping out of the ivory game, uh, that leaves a vacuum. And there are still countries that are going to sell illegal ivory. Uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and uh, these countries may actually decide to take up the slack where China no longer produces. And that's going to that's gonna decimate the African elephant still. China is a beautiful country, as I said, but it struggles with many different problems, and it has a very similar thread to, uh, to Tanzania and East Africa. That is to say that climate change and, uh, and habitat destruction is, uh, is doing a number on their wild animals. It's just uh, actually one of the reasons I decided to go take a look at, uh, at pandas. So Donna was asking, can previously carved items uh, items still be sold? Yes. So Donna was asking, can previously carved items uh, items still be sold? Yes. They have to have a certificate of antiquity, and they can be sold. Um, it's important to note that the number two consumer of illegal ivory in the world is the United States of America. I'm going to say that again. The number two consumer of illegal ivory is the United States of America. And, um, and so if we think we're not part of the equation, we're wrong. We're the driver of the demand. And this is why I called this presentation an affluence problem. It's not a poverty problem because it's simple economic supply and demand. If, if there was no demand for this, Oh yeah, it, Donna is asking about the certified. <laughs> well, in theory, and I'm going to use air quotes, which I hate. In theory, uh, certification says that the ivory is more than a hundred years old, so it wasn't taken or called uh, in a in a contemporary sense. It's historical ivory. Somebody just happened to find 50 elephant tusks sitting in their garage that their grandfather had brought back from Africa 100 years ago. They can still carve that, and they can still sell that, and Americans can still buy it. Um, that shouldn't happen, and it's becoming more difficult, but it, it, it's still very common. I was in another city in uh, in China called Chengdu, and in Chengdu, in, uh, in just their little uh, knickknack stores. You can find ivory, and they're very proud of the certificate. This is antique ivory, um, and I looked at the ivory, and it just looked clean and it looked new. And I can't say for sure it wasn't a hundred years old, but they had a lot of it, a lot of gray areas to it, and that's why the the poaching game, the ivory game, isn't uh, isn't over, even though China and Hong Kong are officially stopping. So China's loss of habitat is the main threat against pandas, but their secondary threat, and this is not as well publicized, is poaching. Poaching pandas for body parts, for skins, for their paws. Um, their paws are used medicinally. They're magic in, uh, in uh, traditional medicine. And, um, and mounting their heads on walls is something that, that happens still um, illegally in China, but it happens still because there's a market in Russia and Central Asia for these parts. And it's, uh, it's not, not easy to track that because uh, pandas live in, in the mountains. And uh, so I went to uh, Chengdu. I took a thousand mile train trip from Beijing, went to Chengdu, and I spent a few days uh, where I volunteered to take care of rescued pandas, and this is one of them. And uh, this particular panda was uh, really waiting and getting a little bit impatient because I was feeding them. 
<laughs> and uh, laying out their food. Well, was, in this picture, I'm cleaning up the old food, and I'm about to bring them new food. And, uh, and you know, they like to eat. That's what pandas do. They eat bamboo. And uh, so, you know, after I got done doing my work, I got a chance to hand feed them and hang out with them. I did not pet them. You do not pet wild pandas. Uh, even though it's in captivity, the idea for this particular center is to reintroduce as many as they can back into the wild so that a wild population continues to, to grow. The problem is the destruction of habitat with the damming of the Yangtze River, with the, uh, the, with the taking of lands for industrial use, with the uh, destruction of the, the quality of water, and then add into that climate change with rising temperatures is shrinking their habitats dramatically. And, uh, and then you throw poaching in the mix, and they face a lot of obstacles. So right now there's between two to 3,000 giant pandas, and their numbers are supposed to be stable. How long it'll stay this way, I don't know, but the people that work with them, the people that, that I met at the centers, at the research center, um, they're not as optimistic as you would see in news reports. They seem to think that wild pandas will actually go through another decline because of all those things that I talked about, habitat loss, climate change is still driving them. Bamboo loss, wild bamboo. We're talking the big, giant bamboo forest. Um, that shrinks because, uh, because people are coming in, clear-cutting those areas, the hillsides, the mountains, the, the lumber industry, Sarah, the... Uh, the need to uh, to build roads to support industry, um, factories, that sort of thing. It's just destroying their food sources. As you can see here off the Yangtze, the uh, the damming in the river is uh, is really pushing the uh, the waters up to the edge of the growth of the cities. So the urbanized areas, urbanization. Of, uh, of parts of China, and this is where people in China are flocking out of rural villages and into urban centers because that's where their jobs are. Um, it, it, that's where it all comes to a head because you have tons of people that need places to live, and you have a river that keeps doing this, and at some point there's conflict, and this is, we deal with that here in the States with uh, sea level rise, with uh, climate change. Um, it's all kind of coming to a head because of urbanization. And, and how to manage that is something that I don't have the answer for. It's just something that right now you can see is a growing problem that's going to need answers. Baby pandas. Now, Chengdu's other research center is actually a breeding center. And they, to date, have bred 240 baby pandas which is amazing because when you talk about a population that, that has two to 3,000 pandas, breeding 240 of them is 10% is of all the pandas in the world. It is a huge conservation success. The downside is right now most of these pandas bred in captivity stay in captivity. They end up in, in zoos, which, uh, which is not helping the wild panda population. But if you take the uh, if you take the, the problems of habitat loss, you take the problems of, uh, of climate change into effect, we have to tackle those bigger problems before we can put pandas back in the wild uh, that are actually going to be able to reproduce and thrive. So it's one of those problems that has no easy answer. And it opened my eyes to, to further um, seeing all the ancillary things that are connected uh, when you talk about poaching, and again, pandas are poached animals, um, it's not as clear-cut as, as it seems. So the history of poaching is the history of turning animals into commodities. And when you look at a historical picture like this, you can see just the, the abundance the overabundance of, uh, of animals that people came into contact with in areas where they had never been before. And the, the uh, seals here 
it didn't have a uh, natural instinct to evade these people, and they literally went in and took thousands upon thousands of these seals. And this continues to this day. So to define poaching, we're talking about the illegal killing of animals. And, um, and, and I'm going to make an argument here that is not strictly scientific. The, uh, the fact that, that we do a lot of resource management, wildlife management, based on killing animals to preserve other animals, in my opinion, is, is tantamount to or the same as poaching. So what I do currently, outside of writing books and making films, is I'm a volunteer responder for the uh, Waka Marine Mammal uh, Stranded Network, and we respond to calls of stranded, alive and dead animals, marine mammals. Um, and a large quotient of what we do outside the summertime is deal with potential poaching issues. And part of our job is to document for the federal government uh, what they call human interaction related deaths, mortalities. Uh, here is an adult female California sea lion, um, which we found ultimately no signs of, uh, of human interaction. She died from old age. Part of what we do is just deal with animals that end up in conflict with people for no particular reason. These little sea sausages, as I like to call them, they're small, they're wriggly, and they get places that they ought not to be, like the one in this picture. <laughs> and um, and the thing is, you know, they need a little helping hand so that they don't accidentally get hurt or they don't come in contact with people that don't know how to deal with a stranded seal pup. Or, in this case, this, this seal pup wasn't even stranded um, because adult female mothers of seal pups, they put the baby somewhere they think is safe and out of the way of predators, and they go and they, they feed for hours. Could be eight hours, could be 10 hours. Um, and then they come back and they get junior and they go swim away. And of course, being mammals, the, the pup just needs some milk. So mama has to feed, the pup comes back, or the mama comes back, the pup feeds. And, um, and sometimes they think things are safe because they're not moving at that moment. And in this case, it was the engine well of a small boat, and she took the pup in there. So all we had to do was uh, was kind of shoo it away and hope that it swam to uh, a dock and put itself on a dock, which it did. And guarding these animals is important because, unfortunately, here in the U.S., harbor seals and sea lions are highly poached. And it's underreported because, because there's a very sad effect when it comes to pinnipeds that people believe them to be responsible for the decline in salmon, um, the decline in herring. They, they, they scapegoat sea lions and seals for the decline in all sorts of fish in the world. Uh, one of the things that, that I uh, had done some research on last year was um, when we talk about ocean uh, overfishing, it's 90% uh, of the world's fisheries today are either fully exploited, overexploited, or they've collapsed. 90%. And um, you can't blame that on animals that have always lived in the wild. And yes, even the babies are targets. Now, in this particular case, this is signs of human in interaction. And that summer, we dealt with uh, four cases that were very similar, where harbor seal pups have been shot uh, by a high-powered rifle, probably by fishermen um, here in Washington State. And dealing with that problem is uh, the only way to fully deal with it is to change the mindset. You have to get people to stop scapegoating these animals for being the predators that they are. They're mid-level predators, um, and they're pretty, pretty efficient at what they do. But, uh, but they're not the main cause for fish decline. Uh, fish numbers are dropping because they've been traditionally overfished in the past 100 years, and, and not even uh, selectively. And then, uh, and then you've got an ocean that is changing. It's changing salinity. It's changing temperature. It's changing sea level. 
coastlines are changing, habitat is being destroyed, uh, plastics are being introduced in numbers that we don't even have a full grasp on. Pelagic plastic is so pervasive that um, fish today that are being brought in and examined, once they open up the fish on the inside of them, about 80% of them right now have plastic in their digestive tract. And these are the fish that end up on people's tables and people eat. Uh, these microplastics are ingested by human beings as well. All these problems are combined, are called anthropogenic. Anthropogenic issues are human-caused detrimental issues. And, uh, and we can't blame little guys like this, this baby harvester. Um, and unfortunately, the government is not on board with that. Uh, here in Washington, the government flat out makes a case that uh, sea lions are the reason why salmon numbers are depleted. The irony in this is they use Columbia River as an example. Um, I have a different theory. See, the Columbia River Basin, which encompasses Washington State, part of Oregon, Idaho, British Columbia, is, uh, is a huge river system. And on it, there are 240 dams in place, human-made dams. And, uh, and we know from, from uh, not only scientists that have done the research, uh, but ecologists back when they were building the dams had told us that the, uh, the damming of rivers was going to deplete the salmon runs. Um, so it's ironic to me that the Washington government has zeroed in on the Columbia River and the Cooley Dam um, which is a choke point for salmon because they can't get through it easily as, uh, as the sea lions fall. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about. We need to turn our, our vision of this around if we're going to preserve not only the, uh, the salmon, but to, to make sure that the sea lion populations are, uh, are healthy and not exploited and that they are no longer target of, uh, of misrepresentation. So at the end of the day, they're cute. <laughs> they're wonderful creatures. They're highly intelligent. They're marine mammals. Um, they're friendly to a certain degree. I mean, no, if you're not certified, don't pick up a seal pup. Don't do what you see me doing in the picture. Um, but but they they have lives. They have they have connections, social connections to the groups that they're in. Um, they're important to the ecology of the ecosystem they live in. And if we remove, you know, just willy-nilly decide to remove some, we're damaging the ecosystem that they live in. This takes me back to Africa. This starts to sum up the whole thing. What I learned out of this and the hope that comes out of this is we have to start looking globally at these issues. You know, the, the old saying is to uh, think globally and act locally. But I want to extend it out to thinking globally, acting locally, so that it affects the whole world in a positive way. Every small thing you do, anything that you decide to do that takes pollutants out of the ecosystem, it cleans up watersheds, um, reducing, you know, simple things. And I'll give you a couple of good examples. Number one, if you go to a restaurant and you order a drink, it's become second nature to me now. I just... Ask them, please don't bring me a straw. And you might think, well, that's nothing big. Um, but if, if, you, if you take into account the number of plastic straws that end up in a marine environment, we're talking about tonnage. We're talking about millions of these things around the world. And they stay in the environment. I mean, plastic's not going to break down uh, in the ocean environment for at least a 1,000 years. And, um, and so animals are going to ingest it. They're going to die from it. They're going to get entangled in plastics. And taking straws out of that equation is a great first step that you can do immediately today. And, and, and I know it's really rough to actually drink from a glass without having a straw. But it can be done. And, uh, and so you start with yourself. If you get your siblings to do it, you get your parents to do it, you take that and multiply that out on a yearly basis of how many straws you can take out of the environment, out of the landfills, and, uh, and your one action turns into a thousand straws every year taken out of the environment. That's huge. 
So that's one thing. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about going vegan, vegetarian. It doesn't have to be that drastic, but the reality is, is that meat production, monoculture, which is the uh, agriculture that feeds uh, beef and cattle production, is uh, is really destructive in, uh, in on several layers. So you've got uh, carbon emissions, but you've also got land use and land destruction, uh, habitat destruction that comes from this water usage. Water, water usage is huge. South Africa right now is sitting 80 days away from no longer having fresh drinkable water in Cape Town, which is millions of people that are going to be faced with a crisis of not having water. And this is going to continue to happen. This isn't something that, oops, just happened one year. This is going to continue to happen. So I want you to look at the picture, the slide that I have. This Maasai child is looking at a, uh, at a fire that the chief actually started to show me that he, he was preserving the traditional ways. He started that fire in his hands from uh, a little bit of straw, some cow dung, and a stick. In like 40 seconds, it was better than a lighter. And, uh, and this knowledge to pass this on to the younger generation, the generation that's being courted to go live in the cities where there are jobs and cell phones and all this different stuff, is, uh, is the battle that's going to end up saving or dooming the animals in Tanzania. And here in the States, that battle ends up in your lap. Um, I can't do it alone. There's only so many of these guys I'm going to be able to pick up and uh, and take into rehab and and make sure they get you know treatment and end up back in the wild. Uh, but I'll tell you the numbers don't work like that. I see more of these harbor seal pups dead than I do alive. And uh, and so that's something else we can work on. If you see something, you got to say something. Reporting illegal. Animal killing is important. It takes courage, but I really, really want to want to ask you to do that. Have that courage. Report it to law enforcement. Uh, seek out stranded networks. If you see an animal that looks like it's in distress, uh, most of the United States has uh, organizations like the Stranded Network here that cover the shoreline areas that can go in and investigate. Even if it doesn't end up in a rescue, they can at least do the information gained from uh, from watching that animal and making the determination if it needs help is really important. Um, another step you can do is everybody lives near a river or a stream. And if you start in your local town and you find a, 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 a watershed area, you find a, a stream or a river, and you organize a cleanup to just pull plastic and, and, and trash materials, off of the shores of these rivers and streams, um, you're literally going to be saving animals and probably people down the road because whatever ends up in a marine environment ends up in the people that ingest the uh, the animals taken from the marine environment. The children are absolutely going to be the future, whether it's Tanzania, China. I met children that know so much more about animals at their age than I to almost at my age now. Um, it's not just the internet. I think people are becoming more connected in in these countries to the uh, to the culture that's connected to these animals. You cannot imagine Tanzania without thinking of elephants and black rhinos and lions and giraffes and all of these animals are actually being poached. Rhinos and lions and giraffes and all of these animals are actually being poached and taking illegally and changing the mindset and, and getting a different perspective uh, for these children is important. It's not a poverty issue. These children in this picture, their, their mother makes what, what amounts to about $300 a year. That's her annual income. But these are happy children, and these are children that believe that the forest that surrounds the rice paddies are full of animals that need to be there. They love the call of the monkeys, which are these beautiful, furry, black and white monkeys that live there in the night and in the mornings that call out. And it's like a serenade of a cacophony of, of sound that even, I'm deaf, by the way, even as functionally deaf as I am, 
my hearing aid, I could hear them calling out, which is a beautiful thing. Um, that's the future. So, Asante Sana Marafiki, which is uh, Kiswahili for uh, thank you very much, my friends. Um, I'm glad to be here doing this again this year. And I just want, if I impart nothing else, I want everybody to think about the fact that poaching is a global issue. It's also, like I said, it's an affluence issue. It is driven by the demand, not by the supply. And if we look at it that way and we work together as a team, as all of us, we can make an impact. And at very least, sharing information, educating people is, uh, is, is the key. Because uh, getting the word out, continuing this conversation, it's, uh, it's how things stay relevant in people's minds. Um, if there's any questions about any of this, I'm going to jump back to the beginning of the slides. Feel free to ask. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I, I love doing MBTI, uh, being able to partner with uh, with folks. It's amazing. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I'm actually moving it back to uh, African elephants real quick because I think there was a lot of interest in that. And I kind of went through those pictures pretty rapidly. So uh, Tanzanian elephants, right now, they're losing approximately 30,000 elephants. Well, I should say African elephants, not just Tanzania. They're losing about 30,000 elephants a year. 80 some odd percent of those to poaching. Uh, if you guys do get a chance to read Rough Cut, not a plug for the book, <laughs> uh, but there is a section on here on uh, domestic poaching, which is. Uh, which is part of this presentation. And it's interesting because I really examine how killer whales became a commodity. And because the Orca Conservancy is the one that's sponsored today. Yes, the book is uh, the book is Rough Cut. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble Online. Homeostasis Press has it as well. Um, it's, it's a good read, not just because I wrote it, but because it's full of educational information, um, and it's certainly family friendly, so there's no nasty surprises in it. But, uh, but what I was saying is orcas, uh, killer whales in general, became a, uh, became a commodity, and it talks about that you know, really, really, really in depth. See more. Okay, so the question is, are they seeing more elephants without tusks being born, or are tusks able to be, I'll scroll down, removed without drastically harming the elephant? Um, it's not a viable thing to remove tusks. Now, they are seeing more and more elephants born with smaller tusks or no tusks at all, which is only good in the sense that they're not going to become targets for poaching. Uh, Ecologically speaking, a small tusk elephant isn't helpful to that environment the way that a tusker is, because um, because of this right here. When uh, oops, when we talk about helping the ecosystem, they need those tusks. Those tusks to them are like uh, a combination of of their their trunk and their tusks is like hands. And um, they need these these tools, you know, these personal physiological tools, to uh, to do the things that are necessary for their health, to get minerals, to uh, to clean their bodies, to clean their tusks, and uh, and the the byproduct of that is something that helps thousands of species of animals, and uh, and the savannas wouldn't actually exist if it wasn't for the elephants, which help keep down 
uh, the grasslands from expanding and uh, helps keep shrubbery alive. And um, yeah, it's just really important. Somebody's typing a question now. <laughs> oh, so last five minutes, one of the things that, uh, thank you, Sherry. I think one of the things that, that I can throw in there in the last five minutes is uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about this part of it. So last year I traveled to seven different countries um, for the research um, on global poaching. The ultimate goal for that is going to be another book and uh, on global poaching. And, and I made sure to include, I went down to Southern California and, uh, and the border of Mexico. And there's a lot of, animal poaching that you wouldn't really think um, is an issue that, you know, just doesn't come to the forefront. Thank you, Kelly. And, um, and the reality of it is, is that they're a huge issues. So like uh, abalone um, down in Southern California is a major poaching uh, target. Uh, the lobsters in uh, San Diego Bay. Um, but what I, what I ended up doing is I talked with some folks from a sea turtle rehabilitation uh, facility and uh, and over in Tijuana and I got to see the uh, results of uh, sea turtle leather products which are sold again American tourists it's a supply and demand issue um, American tourists are buying belts made out of sea turtle leather and it's it's nonsensical and sea turtles almost all species of sea turtles are either endangered or vulnerable and um, and we just gotta think smarter as a as a population about these these different species related things because you know if you get rid of animals like uh, you end up seeing elephants go into extin extinction you see southern resident orcas slide into extinction uh, grizzly bears whatever you talk about um, it has human effects. And, and if you don't see it from any other perspective than money, um, these, these places lose money as they lose animals. Uh, I, I cannot imagine Washington State without a whale watching and a whale tourism industry here um, to see these beautiful creatures. And, uh, but it will happen if, uh, if things don't change. Uh, salmon get depleted. Salmon are gone. Uh, there's, there's so much involved in that. And, of course, you know, the long view of it means that we're going to have to sacrifice a little bit uh, and change our way of doing things. But I think it's worth it. I truly do. Well, that's the end for me. That's all I got for you today. Uh, I'd like to thank my, my co-pilots, Mr. Panda, Mr. Herbertiel. And uh, thank you guys and uh, Elgin High School. Uh, just love the MBTI. And uh, can't wait to do it if I uh, get a chance next year. Can't wait to do it again. Thank you, Riley. Everybody take care. Have a good day.
Happy Friday.